Bryn Kaladin. Welcome to this edition of Duffin Life. I'm your host, Tina Avery. Thank you so much for joining me. And if I haven't, if you haven't seen me online, Happy New Year. I hope you had a wonderful holiday, and I'm so glad that you're back to join us. Uh, again, we have an exciting uh, few segments for you, um, and I'm just going to ask you the question, are you into winter sports? Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a big sports person. We're, we've talked about this before, so you all know that. But joining me today, I'm happy to uh, introduce uh, David. David. I was going to, I don't know why I'm calling him David. Uh, Terrence C., who is the um, director of Alpine and Recreation at yep. Hockley Valley Resort. Yeah, thanks, Tina. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you, too. And I was telling Terrence prior to this, uh, to coming on air, that I actually knew somebody with the same last name, and his name was David. And it was like 20 years ago, and yeah. I can't believe I started by calling you David, but it's a good compliment okay. because he was a great guy. Well, that's the primer, <laughs> and uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about skiing and the priming, so we'll, we'll, we'll t dovetail that all in together. Yeah, absolutely. It'll all tie in. But yes, Terrence, thank you so much for joining us. So we're going to start off by just talking about some basics. For, for those people who may be interested in learning a little bit more about ski, snowboarding, a few other yeah. things, um, but let's start with... The, the ski. How, how long have you been skiing? I've been skiing for over 30 years. I started when I was 16 and I just really took to the sport right away. I think uh, when, when you think about skiing, some of the other sports that you might do in Canada really help, like ice skating. Mm -hmm. A lot of the hockey players, they come and they're already on the green run after like 15, 20 minutes already because wow. it's a lot easier to balance on such a long platform versus a, a short little skate. Wonderful. Well, let's talk about that. So when we're downhill skiing, I know there's a difference between downhill skis and cross-country yep. skis, yep. which I'm going to get you to tell me a little yep. bit about. And then how does one go about finding, like sizing for skis and how does that work? Yeah, so si skis are based um, on like, they, they have this kind of hourglass or this parabolic shape, right? Mm -hmm. So they're best suited to your height and your weight. And so the way the ski works is if you put it on edge and you flex it, it actually will carve a nice C shape into the snow for you, right? Okay. So that's kind of what it is. So when you're first starting out, you generally want skis not longer than up to your chin. Okay. Um, kind of intermediates between your chin and your nose. And then if you're an expert, you can basically take any ski you want and, and go out there. It just depends on how fast you want to go. The longer the ski, the more stable. You can go faster. Okay. The shorter the ski, uh, more turns. So I basically need something the size of a 12 inch ruler then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe a bit longer than the, uh, okay. the length of your shoe, okay. but yes. <laughs> now, what is the difference between a cross country ski and a downhill ski? So a downhill ski basically has metal edges and it helps you turn. Okay. So most of the cross country skis or all the cross country skis don't. And then there's two types. There's the classic where uh, you can imagine just people going in a straight line in the track mm -hmm. or they have the skating style, which is a shorter one. It's even closer to ice skating where you're kind of doing a herringbone motion in the snow. Okay. So, yeah. And I, I, you see, I haven't told you this story yet, okay. but for me, um, I have bad knees and skiing is just like a, you know, if yeah. I fall, there's no chance I'm yeah. getting back up. So Yeah, skiing <laughs> is actually quite gentle on the knees versus other things. Uh, mm -hmm. Generally, when you're gliding, especially on a green run, there's it's not too bumpy. And then the way they groom it is actually quite smooth. So okay. um, I, I think a lot of the knee injuries come from four twisting falls. And yes, you could hurt yourself like that. But when you're actually skiing, it's actually... It's okay for it's your not, It's not yeah. a very high impact no. type of thing, no. for sure. It's just to get the person on the skis yes. and then to pick them up when they may have yes. a mishap and fall exactly. down. <laughs> years and years ago, I used to cross-country ski, yeah. but I have never tried downhill. Just yeah. Uh, for yeah, and even from the cross-country, like I think as you're uh, gliding across the snow, going up is easy. Coming down is a little bit more, uh, more, more of a challenge, and mm -hmm. that's where the downhill skis have the edge, literally, because they had the metal edges help kind of slow and shape the turn for you okay good to know well let's continue to talk about ski equipment and yeah. what people if you've never tried it before what what where do you start where do you begin yeah I think you should go and either speak to someone you know mm -hmm. who either teaches um, I'm part of the Canadian Ski Instructors Alliance the CSIA and it's a nationally regulated body there's 20,000 members there's about 8,000 in Ontario which is the largest region and if you can get yourself connected to a ski pro that's awesome mm -hmm. if not no worries you can look up stuff online right. <laughs> I know a lot of people do that and then they come and they do it or even your local pro shop is really excellent. A lot of them will um, 
ski the hill that you're on, they'll know the hill, they'll know the type of conditions, mm -hmm. and they can really, really help you help you out with kind of uh, equipment selection. Yeah, and if you have the uh, the ability to possibly take a lesson or two, it's probably a good, ex yeah, good thing to do. Yeah, skiing is one of those sports where versus running, walking, riding a bike, I think skiing, you actually get the most benefit out of taking a lesson. Um, there's a lot of dynamics that happen. One of the things that makes skiing really difficult is the changing snow conditions mm -hmm. so when you first come out the I think speed management is the big thing that you right. want to do you want to be able to stop uh, change your direction and the snow may, uh, takes a big place in that so when it's colder uh, the the snow crystals are sharper it actually slows you down okay and then when it's warmer it's more a little granular you can actually go a little bit faster so even from run to run it's always different so that's the one I, I would say the one big difference in, in terms of skiing where it's a more of an open skilled sport mm -hmm. versus let's say swimming where you're in the pool the water doesn't really change much maybe the length of the pool <laughs> maybe the temperature Temperature, but it's not you're not going to encounter moguls you're not going to encounter right. other swimmers whereas in skiing you've got other skiers to work, contend with or snowboarders and things like that so yeah it sounds crazy fun like yeah. I I would love to do it I really I yeah. really would love to yeah. try it but I have that hesitation going mm, if I fall down who's coming to pick me up yeah I, th <laughs> I would I would even add to that I, I think one of those most primal things is like if you've ever driven in the country, you see the snow covered field, mm -hmm. and you think, oh, it'd be great to slide down a toboggan. That's really kind of the skiing feeling. It's right. that gliding, that freedom of movement, and I think it's it's in all of us to, to want to go down a slide. Absolutely. So one of the important things to wear when you're skiing would be a helmet. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's uh, probably one of the most highly recommended pieces of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it's either protection from yourself if you're falling or even if someone else hits you. Right, then, yeah. Then I, I just remember years ago when my son was little, we were we were tobogganing and going mm -hmm. and we were sledding and doing mm -hmm. that and he went down the hill yeah. and he was just standing at the, he was just getting up and then this gentleman had just whipped down the hill and went right into him so he yeah. lifted up in the air and just literally came like yeah. these things can happen yeah. when you when you think you're being it's safe when you and, least expect yeah. it you're staying on the side of the hill and then someone kind of wipes you out so <laughs> it's really important control. to be aware yeah yeah, yeah. or things yeah. just happen yeah for sure <laughs> for sure so let's talk about what i have this is this is kind of a new fangled -y type thing yeah. fairly new in the industry I yeah think. so what you'll see is a lot of blending of the different sports so this is what they call a uh, from atomic it's a backland it's a multi-sport helmet Mm -hmm. It will do uh, skiing, it will do bike riding, and we'll do rock climbing all in the same. They're wow, all for that. Awesome. Uh, in this particular helmet, it actually blends some technology with it. There's a little sensor, so if you get uh, any impact from any side, it uh, connects with your phone. You can see where the impact happened. If the impacts happen up to a certain point, it'll tell you that the helmet's not safe to use anymore. Wow. And probably the be best feature is that. Um, if you're skiing and you actually have come to a sudden abrupt stop, mm -hmm. you will actually, uh, the phone will actually call your, your uh, emergency contact and let you know that something's happened. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. It's come a long way from just throw something on sure. your head. For sure. For <laughs> sure. It's more than just styrofoam and plastic. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some usability things um, like this one here. You can attach a headlamp to it and things like that. And it's fully reflective. So they've really taken a lot uh, into kind of uh, constructing the helmet so that it's more than just protecting your head there's there's a lot of uh, utility features to it that is absolutely awesome so let's talk and you brought me a boot tell me a little bit yes. about what we're looking at here yeah so one of the things when you first put on your ski boots it feels like you're wearing a cast on both feet mm -hmm. so that's very uncomfortable for most people right so this boot here it's uh, based on a mountaineering boot so there's a little latch at the back you pop it up mm -hmm. it will actually allow the f cuff to flex okay and the buckles actually open up as well they'll stay attached but then it's basically like walking around in your shoes oh, okay. so so they've taken some mountaineering stuff and then um, allowed you to have that usability, right? So I think a, a lot of people, they, they feel like it's uncomfortable, but these also come in different widths as well. So this one is the the Atomic Hawks uh, XTD for extended use, mm -hmm. uh, 130 flex. So it, it's a very great boot, especially in Ontario, especially if you have little kids and you kind of have to chase them around. <laughs> like this is a great boot to have. And then when you want the performance, you just buckle it up, uh, put down the, the spine and then it you're ready to go. Amazing. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, is it recommended for skiing to wear goggles as well? Oh, absolutely. 
for yeah. sure for your visibility i think one of the if you want to talk about helmets the other thing that's really kind of come into the industry is the visor helmets where the goggle and the helmet are all one piece okay and so you just flip it up flip it down no different than like a motorcycle helmet let's say okay so goggles for sure i think your visibility is uh one of the the most key things that that you need to be able to travel safely down the hill and even like like we were saying like avoiding people from your peripheral so um the other thing that um a lot of the lenses now uh, they're photochromic so you don't even have to change lenses oh, wow. it'll change the amount of visible light that enters into through the lens so you can just have one lens all day technology is a wonderful thing yeah. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. for sure. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between skiing and snowboarding. Okay. Is it, tell us a little bit about, I mean, is it still the same premise when you're picking a snowboard? And is it easy for someone who skis, can they just hop on a snowboard and? Yeah, you know what? I think when you're first starting, it doesn't really matter which one you do. I always get this question, what's easier to start with skiing or snowboarding? Mm -hmm. I think from, um, uh, the natural evolution of mankind. Skiing's a little bit easier because you have independence with both feet. Mm -hmm. The snowboard, once you're on it, you're strapped onto it and so you don't have the same mobility. So some people don't like that as much. So it's really personal preference. But from a gliding, uh, going down the hill, they both, both, uh, all the companies come up with uh, great equipment and, and it's, they're both very easy to and use. And the same learn. concept with the snowboard up to the chin type of idea? Uh, you yeah, you, you're probably, probably somewhere in your stern them okay to maybe the bottom of your neck and then from your neck to your chin and then your chin to your nose something like that yeah so again it's the same premise the shorter it's easier to turn and it's more mobile the longer allows you to have uh, more kind of you can go faster yeah I think it would be I think just the concept of having two feet strapped to one board yeah. stresses my brain a little yeah. bit versus yeah. the you have the ability yeah. to you know separate your feet yeah. and move them accordingly as you need to. for sure and I uh, I do both sports and I would say the one thing that snowboarders always have is uh, obviously the baggy clothes which mm -hmm. is comfortable but the snowboard boots are super comfortable and super warm so some people they actually choose that just because of the um, the, the comfort level so let's talk I mean a little bit everybody has seen the weather we're in January and goodness we never thought it would be this warm um, so let's talk a little bit uh, just a, some basic ideas like uh, how cold does it have to be like to make snow like how does that yeah. work yeah so there's a bit of science to it it's come a long way there are uh, machines that will make plus temperature okay uh, plus uh, in the Celsius range it, they can make snow but it's just basically kind of chipping away at a big ice cube and right. it kind of comes out and it sits for uh, for our um, for general snowmaking minus four is what you need okay because you want not only the air to be cold but you want the ground to be cold as well so when you're making it you need to kind of have that kind of freeze on the ground as well and that will hold it well hopefully um, things are going to be getting a little bit colder for those people who enjoy the winter sports yeah so that you can uh, have more runs open and you can enjoy the sports yeah. uh, a little bit better yeah I would say Ontario probably has the most sophisticated snowmaking in the world um, a lot of areas don't have it or don't have the need for it if you're out west and you're kind of high up in the altitude but yeah. the but the snowmaking on Ontario is excellent wonderful yeah. well we've, we've run out of time Terrence I want to thank you so much for joining us today all right thank you thank you and don't you go anywhere we'll be right back and we'll be cheering for Orangeville and then we're program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Hi, I'm Melinda from Move with Melinda. I am so excited. We have an eight-part fitness series out now. We're going to include stability ball training, resistance training, aerobic training, and flexibility. Right here on Rogers TV. Stay fit, stay healthy.
Hi, I'm Angel Morgan, host of Raising Energy on Rogers TV. Join us this week with our live studio audience for psychic readings that are fun and fast paced just for you. Welcome back to Dufferin Life. If you're just joining us, you join us at a great time. We're going to talk about cheering in Orangeville. And I'm not going to make you all cheer, and I'm not going to cheer for you. <laughs> We're actually talking about cheerleading. Joining me today, we have Lindsay Gross from the Champion Cheer Academy. Correct, yes. You are the director and owner of the, the Academy, correct? Yes. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm so excited because I'll be honest, like when I think of cheerleading, I think of, um, I don't watch the shows, but there's so many shows in the United States about cheer competitions and bad cheering and good cheering and all these types of things that I didn't really realize how popular it is here in Canada. How popular is it in Canada? Yes. Over the past, I would say 15, 20 years, it has exploded in Canada, whereas there's always a couple of gyms within the cities or a little bit further away and now it's just any city you go to any town you go to there's a cheerleading gym or multiple cheerleading gyms within it and it's just exploded in Canada and we have some of the best teams from across the world that um, have placed really well when we go to our cheerleading world championships in Florida so um, we are very good at cheerleading apparently and <laughs> and Canada is is just booming so it's great how did you get into cheerleading I myself used to be a gymnast and dancer okay and trained seven days a week 24 hours a week and once I got into high school I needed something a little bit less demanding on my body mm -hmm. on my schedule and focusing on schoolwork as well so I had joined cheerleading at the time. It was only twice a week and taking up four hours of my time as opposed to 24 hours of my time. Mm -hmm. So my parents really appreciated that. <laughs> There's no doubt in so, my mind, yeah. <laughs> yes, so I was able to, to spend a lot more time on that and still do something that I loved and still do the acrobatic part of it and doing the flips and dancing and then learning something new of doing the stunting and lifting people up in the air me being lifted up in the air. Yeah, the I'm going to say, because you see these these videos of people cheering, and you've got, like, they're being tossed, like, 20 feet in the air, and it's like, oh, yeah. I, hopefully she gets, somebody catches her. <laughs> There's a lot of training, a lot mm -hmm. of drills and practices to make sure, and trust is a big thing when you're being tossed up in the air, and you have to trust that those four people standing on the ground catch you. You know, because when you were, we were talking just briefly before the show and we were just while you were speaking, you were talking about the combination of dance and gymnastics, which is what I used to do as well. Um, I used to do acro and that sort of thing, which is your combination. But then I never really stopped to think, but there's that third aspect of like the, the, the tricks and... Yeah, yeah. The stunting. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and that's what makes it more of a, of a team sport as well compared to... Um, gymnastics and dance you have your your group mm -hmm. um, numbers as well but you also have those solo numbers whereas in cheerleading you have that group so you have 20 kids on the floor 24 kids on the floor and every single one is a huge aspect to the team and you need four people to put a stunt up in the right. air so it's it's a very good team sport and it it includes everyone all the time. Well, that's it. I mean, there there are so many people involved, and there's and the timing, and you're, like you said, the trust. That, that's an, um, at what age can people start cheerleading? Usually, there's classes that start at ages three, mm -hmm. and they go up. We have had some adult classes before. I know that there are some adult teams out there, and um, usually, around the age of 16, 17, they start to retire from cheerleading as as they say because mm -hmm. then they go off to university and sometimes they go into university and join a cheerleading team in university which is always great to see as well and one of the things that i find like and you do have this in dance coming from like a dance background myself as well but one of the things that i find super impressive is the energy like the energy that you have to have as a group like you can't just have two people cheering loudly like you are Yes. That's something, I mean, I guess that, that's almost a skill in itself, I would think. Yes, it, energy is a big thing, 
And I mean, we really work with our kids to always have energy throughout their whole routine. All season long, we work towards a two and a half minute routine and okay. that's what we perform. And it pretty much stays consistent all season long. And sometimes there's a couple of upgrades that we want to do throughout the team. And so the, for those two and a half minutes, we have to train the kids to be on and have that energy going for that entire time so that they don't look tired or they don't look like they're having fun because we're cheerleaders. We need to be cheering each other on mm -hmm. and we need to be there to support each other throughout that whole job of what we're doing. So if, the, if, if parents were interested, their kids were interested, and they're now asking their parents saying, I would love to get involved with something like this. So for somebody who wants to do cheer recreationally, what type of a time commitment is that really? Usually it's about once a week for about an hour for the younger kids, programming is usually about 45 minutes, um, but usually an hour class, they can either get started with like a rec cheer class where they kind of learn about the, the jumps, the tumbling, and the stunting of it. And then there's also tumbling classes that they could take as well that they work on um, their front rolls, their cartwheels, their bridges from standing, their back walkovers, like any sort of skills that they're working on mm -hmm. to learn. Okay, and somebody who wants to get into it competitively, what are you talking about, like time-wise? So there's different levels and different uh, streams that cheerleading has. So there's a prep stream, which is a little bit um, less than competitive, but they still compete at competitions, and they would train about once a week. A little bit longer two and a half hour practice two hour practice depending on the age group and then our all-stars our competitive kids train twice a week up to four hours to five hours a week depending on the level as well and it just it's they train all season long pretty much from beginning of june to end of april wow yep and then are you in and then you go to the world championships or the is it? We personally don't go to the World Championships. We do have a lot of teams over Canada that does go. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of April is usually our national event in Niagara Falls. Okay. And then we gear up and get ready for tryouts in May. That's amazing. So, is like, and you mentioned it briefly. So, is dance something that's just incorporated when you're learning the routines, or they do they do a dance class as well as learning to tumble and to do the tricks? So dance is incorporated within the routines okay. itself. We call it choreography, mm -hmm. and we also have, when we go to competitions, we have a choreography score. So we do have a judge that's specifically looking at the formations of, of how the kids are standing and the transitions of how they're doing, and then usually most routines have four eight counts okay. of a dance okay. in their routine and that's more of the where the dance is focused mm -hmm. to. Um, we don't you normally have just specific dance classes. Okay. It's more of just incorporated within the within their programming. I used to uh, coach gymnastics like level one and level two years and years ago yep. so we would just try to incorporate the dance in there when they were working on their stuff too so it's the same sort of idea. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so if somebody was interested in getting involved in possibly um, like somebody for coaching and that sort of thing, how do, like obviously they have to have been doing it for quite some time. In the eight, but do you have like levels of coaching the same way gymnastics would? We do have levels of coaching. So Canada as a whole right now doesn't fully have a coach's credentialing system, mm -hmm. but um, within each province itself, they are creating their own coach's credentialing system. Okay. So we normally look for, similar to the gymnastics, the NCCP courses, um, we do have kind of the same sort of coaching credentialing system. And then each gym or program that you'd go to would have their own credentialing to do or courses to do as well to become a coach. And I, I mean, I already know that all genders are invited to, to participate, but yeah. uh, I know it's still fairly female based yes. uh, cheerleading. But I mean, you see all these different shows and things where they're, you know, it's lovely to have the strong men in there that can help catch and throw people. Yeah. It always <laughs> helps having those strong men there to to help them and, and help with the stunts and make it look nice. Yeah, we, we don't have enough males in the sport, mm -hmm. I want to say, because we can always take more males in, and it's always nice starting them young so they can yes. fully see where they are developing and growing and really loving the sport. Uh, but it does help a lot, and for some reason, the males seem to learn skills faster than okay. than females, which as a, as a female is sometimes a little frustrating because mm -hmm. it comes easier for them. 
but um, as a whole, yeah, we don't have as much males in the sport, but it is growing slowly. So when you're doing the cheers and the cheers that they're saying out loud, is that something that you write for people or are they written for you? How does that work? We don't normally say cheers out loud oh, no? anymore. Okay. That's kind of, I want to say old school cheer I'm in old. routines. <laughs> Of when I joined cheerleading, I want to say 18 years ago, we did a cheer in our routine. Okay. And then a lot of it got pulled back. However, there's more teams now that are joining a different division, a global division. Okay. That's adding a cheer at the beginning of their routine. Okay. And then still doing their two minute and 15 second routine after. So there are some new divisions that are growing and getting bigger within Canada that there is that global part of it okay. where they are cheering and doing those chants and usually those coaches or the that gym would create that team specific to what their colors are, what their motto is, what their chant is. If they have a mascot, they would add that in and include that into their cheer. Okay, so with, I mean, there's not a lot of equipment involved. So if somebody wanted to join, it's just a matter of what just having clothes to wear, right? There's nothing that they need or? Yeah, so we normally have them wear athletic clothing mm -hmm. and then some indoor shoes if they have it. For competition time, the, there are usually nor, uh, uniforms that they would be wearing. And it's only one uniform. I know a lot of a lot of dancers that come in to cheer, they love it because they don't have <laughs> the 12 different costumes that they have for the, for the season. Mm -hmm. They just have one and we usually wear those for two or three years. So it's, it is, not a lot of equipment, not of a lot of items. That yeah, which is nice because there's not a lot of expense involved because I just remember dancing and you had to have a different costume every time you went on that stage and the quick changes in the back and sometimes you're like, what am I doing to myself? But, yes. Um, so let's talk a, a little bit more about why cheerleading is important for youth and what the, the benefits. Obviously, there's physical benefits, but I, I think that there's much more that benefit the children for just confidence-wise and... There is, they're cheerleaders and within cheerleading, leadership is within that and being a leader and it really helps kids uh, take a stance, be their own, grow into their own self and then having that physical aspect with it as well. For us, we add character traits and character developments into our, into our training as well. We talk about what patience mean, we talk about having a good attitude motivating what motivating is to to you to I to how you can add it to your team mm -hmm. so we do a lot of that and we normally tie in some some life lessons as well mm -hmm. to have those kids not just come in and do an activity and then leave but leave with learning something along the way absolutely and self-esteem Lindsay I want to thank you so much for joining us today no problem. Thanks again for having me. It was my pleasure. And thank you for joining us today. Until next time, bye bye for now. Yeah, so we're still. the Rogers TV viewer response line. Email us or connect with us on social media. It was my daughter's birthday. She was blowing out the candles on her cake when we heard coming from the TV. So we stopped.